Great, so last class. A couple things before I review the whole semester uh, quickly, of course. Um, any of you who haven't completed the course evaluation, it, the deadline for submitting it is December 9th at you know, late, late in the evening, you know, just before midnight. So I'm probably talking to the people who've already done it, but, but uh, anyway, um, I drop your lowest problem set score if you do it. Uh, between now and the final exam, which is a week from today, uh, I will hold my normal office hours, so I'll be an alderman on, on Monday afternoon and in my office Wednesday morning. So if you got questions about stuff, come and see me. Uh, lastly, the final, of course, is a week from today at, in the morning, 9 o'clock. Don't miss it. Don't sleep through it. Uh, it's 60 questions, multiple choice, same as the other in concept, the same as the midterms. Uh, I will, I treat it as, as 30 questions that are the third midterm and 30 questions that are potluck across the material. And as always, I encourage you to take the old exams and use them as study tools, like to, to point out things that you're having trouble with in every which way. So any questions about sort of class logistical stuff? Okay. So, I try to review the whole semester in, in uh, you know, 50 minutes. I started off with simple stuff like inertia and the idea that a skater left alone, the skater just keeps doing what the skater was doing, moving at constant velocity. A little later, we discovered that's, uh, well, well, I told you, told you about momentum, one of the conserved quantities of physics, of nature. And, and really, the concept of inertia lives, it, it is associated with momentum. If you've got momentum, you have to keep moving with it. It's, it you, know, you, you can't hide it. So if you've got momentum to the right, you're going to keep moving to the right. Uh, so, so the whole idea of inertia really uh, originates in momentum. Um, same with, with, with rotational inertia, which, started, which showed up in, in seesaws. It's, it's angular momentum that's, that's making that happen. Uh, in, in falling, uh, so I ended up, okay, just to remind you, of course, forces cause accelerations. They also transfer momentum, so those go together. But they, forces don't cause velocity, so, so make sure that you're, you're okay and comfortable with the idea that something can move without being pushed. It, it, if it's already moving, it's going to keep already moving. Um, in the world of falling balls, I introduced the, the first official force, which is gravity. And things here near the surface of the Earth develop a weight. They experience a weight. That's, grav that's the Earth's gravity pulling down on them. Um, an amazing thing about gravity is that the force of gravity pulling downward on something is exactly proportional to that something's mass. Um, remember, ma mass is an object's, the measure of an object's inertia, how hard it is to, to change its velocity. Um, also, how much momentum it carries with it when it's moving at a certain velocity. So, so mass is, a, is a, all about inertia and momentum. Why is there any relationship between mass and weight? Why does gravity pull downward on something with a force that's equal, that that's proportional to its mass? Um, magnets and, and the, the forces between magnets, the forces between electric charges, I mean, they have nothing to do with mass. They're, they're independent of it. But there is this deep relationship between mass and, and weight. And some of the things that it gives rise to are the fact that when you drop something, or drop a whole handful of things, they all fall together, neglecting air resistance, which is in our future 10 minutes. Okay? So they all fall together because, yeah, the, 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 sort of the bigger things, they may weigh more, which by the, itself would make them accelerate faster and fall faster, but they also have more mass, which by itself would make them resist the falling process more and fall slower, and they cancel out perfectly. Yeah, you, you double the mass, well, you get twice the weight, and twice the mass, they cancel in, in the world of falling. Everything falls together. All right. What else about falling balls? OK. Um, the next force I introduced was, was the force between objects when they touch and try, to put, and try to avoid overlapping in space, which some of you long ago learned to have names like normal force and contact force, and I call them support force. The name doesn't matter so much as the, but if I try to make my two hands overlap, they push apart with support forces. And the forces between two, any pair of objects, right hand pushing on left hand, left hand pushing on right hand, those are always equal and opposite. That's Newton's third law. 
Um, and what else about that? Well, we looked, started to see that mechanical advantage, uh, you know, the world of simple machines is, is filled with, with objects that allow you to, to, to trade something off for something else. Like when you go up a ramp, you, you push a shopping cart up a ramp, you're managing to raise all your groceries, raise them in, in height, in altitude, using a small force exerted for a long distance. And, and really what, what you're doing finally is you're investing energy in, in the groceries. You're doing work on the groceries. Remember, energy is another one of these conserved quantities in nature. Um, you're doing work on the groceries uh, and work always involves exerting a force on something and having that some, something move in the, in the direction of your force. You can do the work on the groceries necessary to lift them uh, from the floor onto the table. You can either go straight up with a big upward force exerted for a short distance, or you can go along a ramp and use a gentle force for a much longer distance. But the product of the two, which is the work you do and the energy you transfer to the groceries, um, it doesn't depend on which way you did it. It's going to be the same work you did. You do the same work raising the groceries a certain distance either way. Um, Energy is a conserved quantity. It has no direction associated with it. The other two that I talked about, momentum and angular momentum, they have directions. Energy, no direction. What else about it? Um, you can, it comes in a couple different forms, lots of different forms, sort, technically, I guess. Um, there is one associated with movement itself. So objects that are moving carry with them energy in the form of kinetic energy, which happens to be proportional to the speed at which they're traveling squared. So doubling the speed of something actually really dramatically increases its kinetic energy, the energy in its motion. Um, that, that public service announcement, this is why, you know, there's, why, why fast moving stuff is more dangerous than slow moving stuff. It carries a lot more energy. Um, other forms of energy are things like gravitational potential energy. Uh, Elastic potential energy in something that's stretched or bent. Um, chemical potential energy. Uh, these are all, these potential energies are all stored in the forces between or within things. So when you lift something, you're sort of stretching the force of gravity and storing energy in it. When you're pulling on a spring and making it longer, you're stretching the spring and storing elastic potential energy in it. Um, the chemicals are sort of more complicated. You're stretching stuff too. All right, so that's the world of energy. Uh, showed up in the world of ramps. Um, the seesaw stuff was just to introduce all this, these same ideas in the context of rotation. The world does have things that rotate. And so um, rotating objects have, they, they, they tend to keep doing it. They have rotational inertia uh, as measured by their rotational mass. And you get them, torques are what cause angular acceleration. Stuff like that. Um, I, I mentioned uh, the, the forces between two objects when they try to overlap in space and, and call it, you know, they're support forces, so they push apart uh, so as to avoid overlapping. Uh, those forces are always perpendicular to the surfaces that touch. But there are, in many places, forces that are not perpendicular between objects that touch, but rather along the surfaces. So when I put my hand on the table, yeah, it's experiencing an upward support force, but right now I'm trying to slide it to the right, you know, but I'm not, you know, it's, it's not happening. Why not? Because the force in my hand are exerting forces on each other additionally that are along the surfaces, parallel to the surfaces, and those are all frictional forces. So the forces that, the forces, forces that are perpendicular to surfaces, those are, those are support forces. They're always there when, they, when surfaces try to, try to pass through each other. Frictional forces are along the surfaces and they may, you know, they're, they're more sort of flexible. And I told you that, that, that if, if there's no act, actual sliding, if I'm not actually sliding, I'm not wasting any energy in this process. But as soon as I start to slide, now I waste. I, you know, the energy is seemingly disappearing from the story. There's some work not being done or being done that doesn't get transferred properly. It's, it's becoming thermal energy. And thermal energy showed up you know, all over the place the rest of the semester. Um, it's, it's the same old energy. It's still kinetic energy and potential energy stored in forces between and among things. But it's ground up into little fragments. And it becomes 
so it becomes hard to use because it's so ground up into, into stuff. It's disordered. We, we later down the road, we, we started dealing with the idea of, of, of disordering something. And that once you've disordered something, it's very hard to undo that, not because the laws of motion forbid it, that you can't actually have things move back together and reassemble and so on, but rather because it's statistically unlikely. The reason you don't, you don't win the lottery 100 times in a row is not because it's physically impossible. The laws of nature, the laws of physics and the mo of motion don't forbid it. It's just because it's just so unlikely, right? Random processes don't lead to those kind of things like winning 100 times in a row. All right. That's pretty much the, the, the world of the first two chapters of the book and first three weeks or four weeks of this class. All right. Um, I then started going on to other sort of more complicated mechanical things, like, like a scale. So when you weigh something, really what you're doing is you're supporting nearly, all, nearly any time you weigh something. You're using a device that supports the thing you're weighing, you know, a melon, okay? When you're weighing a melon, you use a device that supports the melon. And it tries to bring the melon to, equal, to equilibrium, that is, no acceleration, right? It's, so, so in principle, the device is pushing up on the melon with the same force, with the force that's equal in amount, but opposite to the melon's weight. So the melon experiences two forces that cancel perfectly. All right? And then the device tells you how hard it's pushing up on the melon. And how does the device know that? Well, the device typically uses a spring to do this. Um, some sort of, something that behaves as a spring. It might not, be, it might not have been sold to the scale manufacturer as a spring, but it, it's a spring. It follows Hooke's law. And who cares about the name? You know, OK, Hooke was a, was a good guy, but, but, but the name isn't important. The idea is important. The most things, when you bend them or, or stretch them or you do most deformations to them, they develop restoring influences, whether they're forces or torques or some mixture of the bunch. Um, the influences are, are, are typically proportional to how far you've taken them away from their, their favorite or equilibrium shape. It's just true of lots of stuff. And springs being kind of the, the prototypical, archetypal, I can't use those words properly, never, never have managed to get them. But, but this, this is a spring it's, it's a spring-like, and it, it, it obeys that rule. Take it one inch away from center uh, equilibrium, and it pushes back with one unit of force. Take it two inches away, two units of force. It's great, OK? So that's the basis for scales uh, when you're weighing something. The, the, the finally, what the gadget does is it watches, it looks at its spring and says, how far did that spring move in order to support the melon? And it, it looks up in a table, in a sense, like, OK, if it moved one centimeter away, or actually, it does the calculation. If it moved one centimeter away from equilibrium, I know that every centimeter is, is 10 newtons or 10 pounds. And I can tell, so I can tell you. All right, so that's how scales balance. Um, as I, as I no noted, the, the, the scale only reports the correct weight of the melon when the melon is not accelerating. It's got to be at equilibrium. If the melon's accelerating, like you just dropped it on the scale, and it's it's accelerating upward, trying to come to a stop. The scale's reported value is not going to be the weight of the melon. Right? So if you're going to you weigh yourself, you, you stand still. You don't jump up and down and try to get the scale to weigh you. Because then you're accelerating, and all bets are off. All right? Um, what was after scales? Uh, bouncing balls. Uh, bouncing balls, there, the surface is, is, has this has the equilibrium shape, and it's got a restoring force when you take it off center. It's not quite spring-like. So balls are actually an exception to my everything's like a spring observation. They're kind of messy. Um, but balls do have this nice ability to store energy and return it, and thereby bounce. So when you drop a ball on a floor or something like that on a rigid surface, during the impact, the ball comes to a stop momentarily, if you drop it straight down. And the energy that it had just before it hit uh, in the form of kinetic energy disappears. Where'd it go? It's, it's in the ball now. Um, it was invested in the ball because the ball had underwent all the deformation. It had worked on its surface, and so it's packed into the ball. And it's either in a stored form or it's in a thermal form. 
and different balls have different uh, abilities to store the energy. Um, so you get a certain, some balls bounce better than others, basically. Some of the, some of the balls, the energy disappears into a disordered form in the, during the bounce, and some balls, it mostly comes back. So the balls that bounce really well are very good at storing the energy and, and returning it, coming back into kinetic energy. Uh, the ones that bounce badly or not at all have just ground that energy up into thermal energy. Um, the ball isn't the only thing that does involve the bounce. In, in the real world, surfaces often deform during the bounce as well. So when a, oh, I don't know, a, I guess when a basketball hits the backboard, the backboard does, is not absolutely rigid and motionless and you know, forbidden to move. It moves a little bit. And so a little bit of energy is invested in the backboard. Um, a, more, a better example is when a ball hits a trampoline. Now, well, the trampoline really does deform. And so some of the energy is stored in it. And so the interplay between the, the, the object that hits and the, and the surface that the object hits, which, so the, the interplay between the ball and the surface it hits, they both can get some of the energy during the impact, and they both can get involved in, re in returning that energy. And I went through all the possibilities. Of like you, like a, even, the, even the bounciest of bouncy balls doesn't bounce well off sand because the dry sand. Dry sand dents too easily, gets most of the energy, and doesn't return it, grinds it right up. Um, on the other hand, um, well, one of the other, other possibilities, see, a, a bean bag, which by itself is a terrible bounce, bouncer on, on cement, it can bounce decently on a trampoline, because then the trampoline gets most of the energy, and the bean bag, we're not really looking at the bean bag's liveliness, bounciness. Uh, it's really about the trampoline storing and returning. And the last part of that story that I, that I talked about was, was when, you, uh, w when a ball bounces off a moving surface, you have to be careful about, about how the impact works and, and the end result. So, so um, I mean, a question that you all have asked me about many times that I've put on the exam many times was, is, is when a, like a soccer ball is coming at your foot and you, and you, and you swing your foot out to hit the soccer ball, and they're both moving according to, well, you and according to the fans in the, in the stands. They bounce off each other in a more complicated way. Then you have to consider what did the ball look like to the, to the surface that it hit, which is your foot. So the ball was coming at your foot much faster than it was moving as viewed by the fans. And then you get the bounce, and then you consider that the, the, the rebound. So that's really enough of the story of, of bouncing balls. Uh, after bouncing balls, yeah, carousels and roller coasters. Um, so the, so the, I, I brought this one in as, as a way to, to look at what it's like to undergo acceleration yourself. We, I'm talking about making other things accelerate. How about if it's you? Well, in that case, you feel uh, a visceral, you get a visceral feeling in response to your own personal acceleration. Because you feel the forces that are necessary to make all your parts accelerate. So if you accelerate to the right rapidly, you're in a, you know, in a roller coaster, or you're in a speeding ca you know, car with the accelerator pedal pressed to the floor, as you, as you accelerate to the right, all your parts need to accelerate as well. And you feel all the internal stresses uh, pushing on the parts to make you move forward. And you, interpret that, your brain interprets those internal forces as like they're gravity. They feel like gravity. They feel like weight. But they aren't. They're, they're, they're what I call feeling of acceleration. You feel, in effect, your own inertia, and the inertia of all your parts. And that feeling is a weight-like experience in the direction opposite the acceleration. So acceleration is to the right, you feel flung to the left. And the, the faster you accelerate to the right, the stronger that feeling of acceleration gets. And you can get weird things like on the loop-to-loop, -loop, where you are accelerating downward so fast as you go through this arc. You're accelerating downward so fast, you're actually accelerating downward faster than gravity alone would do it. So something ha the, the track is actually pushing you down to help gravity bend your path. Right? And I'll remind you, accelerations are any change in velocity, not just speeding up and slowing down, but changing direction counts. So acceleration is downward faster than gravity would do it. Uh, you feel that acceleration. And you feel it as an upward feeling of acceleration that, in this case, is stronger than your feeling of weight. 
So you, what your total effect, the total response that you get is like, <gasps> what I call apparent weight, it feels like it's in the upward direction toward the sky. And since there's a seat above you, you feel pressed into your seat above you. All right? So next time you go on a roller coaster, you know, loop the loop. If you, you want to spoil the experience, yeah, sure, I'll close your eyes and try to tell when you're upside down. You can't do it. All right? Um, on to bicycles. The uh, story of bicycles was a lot, of, uh, was a lot about e equilibria and two, different, two important classes of, or categories of equilibria. So equilibrium is whenever you're, with, as you're experiencing zero net force and not accelerating. But there are some equilibria, like the equilibrium where you're sitting on a tricycle, that are stable, meaning that if something disturbs you and displaces you, I guess, from equilibrium, restoring influences show up whether they're forces or torques or some combination or whatever, doesn't matter. These, these influences that cause accelerations will show up to, 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 to push you back towards the equilibrium. So the equilibrium is, is one to which you keep returning until, you're, until something bothers you too much. You know, a tricycle, you, hit, you, hit, you slam into a tricycle hard enough and the tricycle tips over. All right? But basically it's in a stable equilibrium. Uh, the alternative, which is the world of a bicycle at rest, is an unstable equilibrium. And that's, uh, uh, when it's upright, the bicycle is in an equilibrium, zero net force, but if you tip it away, left or right, uh, away from the equilibrium, influences show up that are not restoring. They're anti-restoring or opposite restoring. They tip you over further, and it's a disaster. So uh, I'm, my, my typical, my, my favorite example of, of an object in an unstable equilibrium is a pencil balancing on its point. In principle, you can do it, but anything that bothers it and over it goes. All right, and stable equilibria keep showing up again. Unstable ones, probably too, but, but we, we kept hitting stable equilibria. They were the whole world of these harmonic oscillators that we just finished. All right, so, so the, the concepts keep, keep reappearing. So that was bit about bicycles, I and mean, I hope you get some, some sense of how, about bicycles, despite being unstable at rest, they're stable in motion because they, they, they spontaneously return you, automatically return you to the, the unstable equilibrium by steering spontaneously. They just naturally steer under your center of gravity and mass and, and pick you back up, get you back to that unstable equilibrium when you're heading forward. So, it was probably lucky on the part of the bicycle, uh, people who invented bicycles, but it was physics finally that did it. Uh, rockets. The story of rockets, I mean, really, really two parts that I, that I, that I care about <coughs> decently is the, the propulsion idea. How does a rocket propel itself? Very simply, it pushes on its own fuel. It throws its own fuel backwards and th that requires that it push on the fuel. The fuel, as, as it has to do, has to push us forward on the, on the rocket, on the ship, and propels it forward. Everything else is details. Um, it is also worth looking at that in terms of momentum. The rocket starts with all of, with, with, for example, with zero momentum, it's at rest. And that momentum is distributed among the, the ship and the fuel, grand total of zero. After it, starts blasting off, it is throwing its moment, the fuel backwards with backward momentum, and it, the ship ends up with forward momentum. But the total stays unchanged. It's still zero. In doing this, I'm neglecting gravity, which is playing around with momentum. But, but, it, but, but a ship in deep space can, can get itself going to the right by throwing its fuel to the left. If it started with zero momentum overall, it's still going to have zero momentum overall, but it's going to be distributed funny. The fuel going like crazy to the left, the ship going like crazy to the right, add up their momentum, still zero. All right? Uh, after rockets. Ah, now we're getting into, into the world of fluids. Um, balloons. So balloons uh, are the story of, of gases and, and, and gases here near the surface of the Earth. Um, first of all, gases exert pressure on stuff rather than forces. They, I mean, only they do exert forces, but it's, it's easier to characterize a gas and, and the way it pushes on things in terms of the gas's pressure. 
because the force that the gas exerts on a surface depends on how big the surface is. That's different from, say, the force I exert on the table. It doesn't depend on how big the table is. Um, air, the air spreads, you know, pushes vaguely across the whole surface. Um, so pressure, uh, I told you the gas is that the pressure of a gas, all else being equal, and all else mostly being temperature, the pressure of a gas is proportional to its density. So you, you pack the particles more tightly, they hit more often, and then they, they produce larger pressure. So the pressure and density go together for gas at constant temperature. Um, if you keep the density constant and you change the temperature, now you're speeding the particles up. And so they hit harder and more often for that reason, and so the pressure goes up. So if you keep density constant, temperature and pressure go together. If you keep temperature constant, density and pressure go together. And if you mess with all of them, it's a mess, OK? But it is what it is. Um, I also told you that, that the pressure develops, uh, is, is, well, it's produced by thermal energy. It's, it's the bouncing of the particles off of things. And if you start substituting little dinky particles for the normal air particles, like helium particles or little hydrogen molecules, either one, or even natural gas particles, which are yeah. Even though they are littler particles, they have less mass than a typical air particle, they contribute just as much to pressure. So you can make gases that have relatively low densities, that is less mass per volume, by substituting the particles to, for, for dinky particles. So, that, so the, the density's gone down, and let's keep the temperature the same, but the pressure is the same. So you're using you know, a container of helium with a bazillion and three particles and an identical container with a bazillion and three particles. If one's got helium in it, one's got air in it, the pressures are the same. It's the same particle density. Um, this allows you to do things like make a, fill, fill a balloon full of a gas that has less, it's less dense and therefore weighs less than the air around it, than the air it's displacing. And this gave rise, this, this well, gives rise. This combined with Archimedes' principle tells you that that balloon is going to be pushed up with a force greater than its own weight, and it will float. Um, Archimedes' principle was this, was this wonderful observation from 2,000-ish years ago that the air in front of me, a blob of air in front of me, is at equilibrium when it's just sitting there, no, no winds and stuff. And it's evidently supported because it's got weight. It's got mass, it's got weight. So it's supported just right to keep it at equilibrium. And if I take that blob of air out and substitute any other thing that's, that's blob-shaped, it's got the same shape, it's going to still experience the same buoyant force that the blob of air had. And so depending on how much that my new substitute blob weighs, it might be under-supported, it might be over-supported. If it's under-supported, it will descend when I let go of it. It will fall, but not quite the full acceleration of gravity, depending on how much buoyant force affects it. And if it weighs less than the air it displaces, it will be oversupported and it will go up when I let go of it. So that was the world of balloons, um, the two classic things you can substitute for, for the air that weigh less than the air are helium and hot air. All right. Um, got into the world of water and water distribution. And here the idea was that if you want to make water move around, you've got to push on it. Um, well, it, it, in the simplest view of the world, where there's no viscosity, no friction-like effects, um, water can coast. It has momentum. It can keep going and doing what it's doing. But to get it started moving or to stop it from moving, you've got to push on it. So it needs forces to make water accelerate. And that's true of any gas, any, any, any liquid, so any fluid. You want to get moving, push on it. How do you push on it? Because you can't, like, your finger and water, they just, it just scoots around your finger. Well, you push it out with pressure differences. Or alternatively, gravity, but let's set aside gravity for a second. If you have a, a slug of water in a pipe, so a cylinder of water in a pipe, you want to get the cylinder moving, and you're not using gravity, you got to push it out with a pressure difference. You get, make high pressure at one side, low pressure at the other, and that pressure difference becomes, exerts a force on this cylinder, slug of water, and it accelerates. 
So, so pressure is really important in the world of, of fluids, and fluids tend to accelerate, tan means with gravity out of the picture. They accelerate towards lower pressure. So when you blow water through a straw, you're putting high pressure in your mouth, atmospheric pressure on the far end, it accelerates towards low pressure, and the water picks up speed and sails off across the room. Um, what else? Ah, Bernoulli's stuff. The idea that, well, if the water's, if we get water flowing and, and going through some system of plumbing, and in the, if you neglect or set aside the issues of the viscosity, the syrupiness of water, and if you limit yourself to a world in which the water flows smoothly, remember laminar flow, no turbulence, it flows smoothly, and it's going through a stationary environment. So as you get steady state flow, flow that, that in which you cannot really see the passage of time, then you get a couple of interesting things. First off, you get streamlines. That is, you can follow drops of ink injected into the water. You can follow them. They'll follow always the same path. If you, if they, if you dropped them in at the same location, they'll follow the same path out of your system, across your system. And if you follow one of those drops along the streamline, its energy, the energy per drop, doesn't change. I should say, really, the total ordered energy per drop doesn't change. Um, we're, we're not dealing with thermal energy because there's no viscosity. We're not going to make any thermal energy. We don't care about thermal energy in this story. The ordered energy consists of one of three things, or, or the sum of three things, actually. Gravitational potential energy, pressure potential energy, and kinetic energy. That sum doesn't change for a drop as it travels along its streamline. So if the drop speeds up and therefore has more kinetic energy, it's got to be using one of the other energies. It's either lost pressure potential energy, or it's lost gravitational potential energy, or both. All right? Things like that. So it was actually, a, so this is known as Bernoulli's equation, I guess. Um, and it's a very useful observation for things like when you watch water go through a nozzle. Well, it's going to speed up because it's got a neck down through that nozzle. Um, if it speeds up, it needs energy from something else. It's going to lose pressure potential energy. Um, conceivably, you can have a weird nozzle that involves gravity. But, but it's one way or the other, it's going to lose energy out of its other forms in order to have more kinetic energy. So it's, a, it's well, it's very useful for for many, for many things dealing with fluid flow. Uh, I then subsequently talked beyond water distribution, talked about the real world of, of fluids. Alas, there are other things showing up, like viscosity, which is the, the syrupiness of fluids. Even air has a little bit of this stuff. And the idea that, that, a, that a chunk of, one, of a fluid passing another chunk of the fluid, they rub on each other. And that rubbing affects the motion. So there's viscosity around it. It typically wastes ordered energy as thermal energy. Um, second uh, observation of complexity in the, in the fluids is that they, they don't always flow perfectly as laminar flow with streamlines. Uh, they can break up into, into, into tumbling stuff, what, what's known as turbulent flow. And turbulent flow is very hard to predict and understand uh, in, in, in full detail. It's a mess. Um, but it does show up. And it tends to show up in, in situations where inertia manages to control, the, uh, to dominate the flow. Uh, viscosity is the friend of laminar flow. Inertia is the friend of turbulent flow. And so syrupy liquids like molasses um, and, and honey and so on, they, they, rare, well, they rarely go turbulent. They typically want to do uh, laminar flow because viscosity is, is the great ordering effect. It, it, it wants everybody, all the nearby portions of fluid to move together because they're clinging to each other fiercely with, with, with viscous effects. All right, so they'll all, you know, come on guys, we're all going, we're all going to the, the pub, okay? Um, they're all, don't worry, they're all over 21. So um, at least that's what their IDs say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so viscosity favors laminar flow, turbulence favors tumbling, turbulent flow. And if you now look at the, at the flow around objects, um, if 
if viscosity is able to dominate the, the mo movement, you get, these, you get laminar flow around objects, the objects do experience and inter they interact with the passing fluid and they experience viscous drag forces. The, the fluid and the, and the object push on each other a little bit by way of this rubbing effect. And so a, uh, if you try to move through air or any other fluid and have it flow perfectly around you, you will still experience a, 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 an interaction that will try to make you move at the same speed, same velocity as the fluid, and that's viscous drag. And it shows up in, in, for balls in the air, it's only when the ball is really tiny, like a dust particle, and moving very slowly. Why? Because any faster and, and inertia becomes dominant and you get turbulence. Um, so uh, real balls moving in air typically uh, are, are in the regime which, where, where, where turbulence shows up. Uh, inertia dominates, turbulence shows up. And so the, the, the most important interaction between air and a ball is pressure drag, which the, the drag that's associated with turbulence. Um, technically, it's, it, it shows up because the pressures around the ball don't sum to zero. The pressure forces, they, they, they sum to a downwind down, uh, force. Um, so pressure drag, um, it's for any of you doing anything in air, driving, running, bicycling, kayaking, the, the, the dominant force that you're fighting that, to keep yourself moving forward. In the absence of any fo force pushing backward on you, of course, you would coast. In practice, you, do, you never quite coast. Stuff pushes backward on you, and the air resistance forces that push back on you, they're all pressure drag. Viscous drag is a, is a, is a minor player. All right? I think that's sort of good enough for that, that part of the story. Uh, airplane, ah, well, airplanes. Airplanes br bring, uh, highlight the fact that not all the forces between an object and the passing fluid are downwind or, or, or in the direction the fluid's passing. Those are all drag forces. It can also, you can also get forces that are at right angles to the passing fluid, and those are the lift forces. Um, they showed up, in, 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 my, in this class, they showed up first with spinning balls. So, uh, uh, yeah. But, but, in, but in airplanes, the, the, the great example. Uh, airplanes wings are designed and tilted so that they deflect the passing airstream. Ideally, it's, it, it, the, the flow is, remains laminar, so turbulence isn't part of the, the, the story. It's a, you know, it's a minor player. It's mostly this laminar flow, uh, but the flow is deflected. It go, the, air, the air comes along uh, at the plane uh, traveling. Uh, the, the air arrives traveling horizontally, and it leaves having been, been deflected downward. And that deflection, you can either look at just the very fact that the air has been deflected downward, and there, it has to be pushed downward, and the air pushed back, it pushed up on the plane. So the plane supports itself against the pull of gravity by throwing the air downward, giving away, the gravity gives the plane downward momentum by way of gravity. And the, air, and the plane says, hey, I don't want to accumulate this damn downward momentum. So it, it gets rid of it by throwing it into the air. Down air, down air, okay? Um, that's just sort of the Newtonian view of things, just laws of motion. Uh, the other way of looking at it is in terms of Bernoulli, the Bernoulli's equation and stuff, that, that, that the airflow is deflected around the, around the wing in such a way that the air traveling over the wing uh, sp has to speed up and it's, it, it trades off pressure potential energy for kinetic energy. So the, the, the pressure on top of the wing is tiny as the air bends toward the wing and around. The pressure below the wing, as the, the, air is, the air is slowed down and deflected downward away from the wing, the pressure rises there at the bottom of the wing. So there's a, there's a pressure imbalance across the wing, pushing up on the wing. So, so you, can, you can look at airplanes flight in terms of either the fact that the plane simply throws the air downward or you can look at it in terms of the, 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 the pressure imbalances across the wing. And they're ultimately the same story, it just looked at differently. Uh, so planes manage to fly that way. They do experience some drag forces, so they have to keep themselves moving forward. And they do that by throwing air backward as well. They do that with propellers or jet engines. Details, ah, set them aside. Okay? With that then, I got into talking about heat and thermal energy and thermodynamics. Um, the idea that 
I, once again, thermal energy is just good old fashioned normal energy, just chopped up into little pieces. And you can create that stuff just by squandering existing energy that, was, that started ordered. Uh, it can be electric energy, you can just send it into a space heater, <laughs> thermal energy. Or you can take wood that was lovely um, chemical potential energy and <laughs> burn it up and turn it into thermal energy. And once you've got that thermal energy, it moves around. And it moves around by the three classic heat transfer mechanisms, conduction, where the heat's going right through the materials, like through a piece of copper, which it does very nicely, um, or through, yeah. It goes through copper especially nicely, because not only does it go by atom by atom by atom by atom in the jiggling motions, but it goes with the help of the electrons carrying it long distances through, through these conducting materials like metals. Uh, the insulators don't have that, so they're, not, they're typically not as good conductors as the metals, with there are a handful of exceptions. Um, that's conduction. Convection was, was where you heat a fluid and have the fluid move, carrying with it the thermal energy as heat. So convection is, is, occurs in our, in our everyday world all the time. You, you turn on the stove or the or your wood stove or the, the stove top, you make hot air, and hot air is buoyant in cold air. It's less dense than cold air, and so the buoyant force up on it is greater than its own weight. Up it goes. So it goes up, hits the ceiling, spreads out, and you tend to get these, these cycles, what are called convection cells running. The hottest air is up there at the ceiling. In many places, you want to bring it down. Like if it's during the winter and you're trying to stay warm, um, you can either get sticky boots and walk along the ceiling, or you can blow the air down, and somehow get it down into where you live. Um, the last heat transfer mechanism is the mysterious one. It's thermal radiation. It turns out that everything emits some amount of thermal radiation. To, to, to not do it, you'd have to be either perfectly shiny or transparent or white, or you have to be at absolute zero, and none of them are possible. So um, everything in this room is emitting thermal radiation, and the thermal radiation depends on temperature and to some extent on the color of the surface, how, how efficient the surface is at absorbing and emitting the, that, that, those particular wavelengths of light. And we're all exchanging thermal radiation in the infrared. That's what things at, at, at or near room temperature do. They exchange thermal radiation as infrared light. And to see sort of how effectively we are, we are exchanging it, you'd have to look with infrared goggles on, you know, special, special goggles. And when you do that, you discover that, that we're all very good. All of our surfaces are very good at emitting and absorbing thermal radiation in that infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, with it, the only real significant exceptions are the metals, the shiny surfaces. Everything else is basically black in that part of the infrared. So we're, we're, we're sending it all over the place. And this is why when you stand in front of a cold object like, like, the, like the freezer, um, you feel cold even though you're not touching the cold air. There, and convection isn't really the issue. It's just like somehow you're just losing heat. To, to, the, to the freezer. How? Well, it's because you're radiating your heat away at it, and it's not returning much. So you're, you're losing heat by, by thermal radiation. All right. Um, I talked about the, the uh, water and its, and its trans, transitions between phases, and the idea that, that at the surface of, say, water and ice, as they touch when they're in contact, they're exchanging molecules all the time. Uh, it's just that in certain contexts, the the exchange is out of balance. Like if you uh, mix water and ice and, and start pouring heat into it, you, you put, put a mixture of water and ice on the, on the stove top and pour heat into it, you will drive, you, the, the ice will shrink, the water will grow, and what you're really doing is you're, you're unbalancing the landing leaving process so that more molecules leave the ice for the water than return from the water to the ice, and the ice shrinks, the water grows. And the other phase transitions are all similar ideas. These exchanges, what are called dynamic equilibria between the various phases, where they're exchanging molecules, but, but uh, one of them is, the, 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 two, the two directions of travel of the molecules may not be in balance. Uh, going on to insulation. Insulation was just controlling, uh, clothing insulation, just controlling the flow of heat, trying to use low thermal conductivity materials trying to keep air from convecting, um, trying to control thermal radiation with shiny things, for example. 
uh, that don't, ex that don't uh, emit or absorb much thermal radiation. Uh, climate, I told you about, was the, 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 the climate change uh, has a lot to do with, with the, the opacity, the darkness and opacity, the, the blackness of the Earth's atmosphere in the temperature range associated with sort of ambient temperatures. The, 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 air, the Earth's atmosphere is not transparent in the infrared. It's, it looks pretty tra transparent and visible, but in the infrared, it's got, a, it's got a, some amount of darkness to it, and we're making it darker and darker as the years go by. Um, thermodynamic stuff, the, the, air, the air conditioners and heat and, uh, and uh, automobile engines, they're both, they're heat pumps and they're heat engines. And the idea is that for statistical reasons, the disorder in an isolated system, in a system that cannot exchange disorder with its environment, that, that, that uh, can't export or import disorder. So an isolated system, it's thermally isolated. The disorder never decreases. And that's a statistical observation. It just can't go down. And it's called the law of entropy, that, that, that the entropy of a thermally isolated system never decreases. And that controls how heat can move around in our world. Uh, how, how, heat and other forms of disorder can move around in our world. The, the heat and disorder in a thermally isolated system can't decrease. But if you've got a system, if, you've got a, if you divide a system into, that one of those thermally isolated systems is into two halves and allow some of the disorder to go from one to the other, you can rearrange things so that, so that one part of the system becomes more orderly and the other becomes more disorderly. On the grand total, the disorder doesn't go down. So that's what we do with air conditioners. We, we move heat from cold to hot, the direction which wouldn't happen naturally, that by itself would make the system more orderly and is forbidden by the law of, of entropy. Nonetheless, we can move heat from the, from the cold air to hot air at the expense of making more uh, disorder in the, hot, in the hot air. And you do that by chewing up electrical energy and making uh, disordered energy, thermal energy. So air conditioners work, but they work, they're limited by the law of entropy. They, you can only move so much heat with a, so much electricity. Uh, cars go the opposite way. They, they, they start with only thermal energy, hot burn gas and the cold outdoors. And in, the, in letting the heat flow from, from the hot burn gas to the great outdoors, that by itself increases the entropy of the, of the world. But the car engine manages to divert some of the heat and turn it into work useful energy, ordered energy, while still not violating the law of entropy. The law of entropy allows that to happen. You don't have to make ec excessive entropy, but you can't reduce it. So as long as you're letting enough heat flow into the cold object from the hot object, you can divert the remaining heat and make work out of it. And that's what a car engine does, and any, any heat engine does, steam engines. Even the winds do this. All right, the last section that I, that, I, that I did was a long story of harmonic oscillators, starting from individual harmonic oscillators, such as those used in clocks, to um, more elaborate but limited harmonic oscillators, like those in all the musical instruments, so strings, columns of air, um, the head of a drum. They're, those extended systems that, are, that have an end, they're limited, they have ways in which they can, uh, they can uh, move, modes of vibration that, that follow the rules of harmonic oscillators. And the, the rule, again, is simple. I'll, I'll say, say it here we're toward the end, running out of time, but a harm, uh, to be a harmonic oscillator, a system has to have a stable equilibrium with a restoring influence that's proportional to displacement from equilibrium. So that this fits the bill, right? Remember, it's a, it's a spring. Springs are perfect. They have a restoring force that's proportional to displacement. So all these objects have that. And the modes of, of vibration of all the musical instrument pieces fit that bill. They are harmonic oscillators, with some exceptions, like the twangy instruments. But uh, so they, they vibrate. They follow the, the, the rules of being harmonic oscillators, so they have the characteristic that, that the period or frequency of, of the oscillation, vibration, doesn't depend on how big the vibration is in sp spatially, the amplitude. So whether you're playing soft or loud on a guitar, same pitch. And the last topic was the C. It's a, it, in, in many ways, it's sort of an endless uh, medium. It's, it's, it, 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 
And so the air column that ends, that goes from my right hand to my left, it's, the C just goes on. And so it has, it also has its vibrational modes. They're also harmonic oscillators. It's just that they travel, those modes do. The ripples head off across the sea, and, and we play in them at the beach. And with that, then, we'll call it a day, and I'll see you guys a week from today in the morning. <laughs> Thanks. It's been fun having you guys, and I'll, I'll miss seeing you.